says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea also was gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I'm making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these things, all these blessings. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. But cowards... Unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and all liars. Their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Then one of the seven angels who held the seven bowls containing the seven last plagues came and said to me, Come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. So he took me in the spirit to a, to a great high mountain, and he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God and sparkled like a precious stone, like jasper, as clear as, crisp, as crystal. The city wall was broad and high, with twelve gates guarded by twelve angels, and the names of the twelve tribes of Israel were written on the gates. There were three gates on each side, east, north, south, and west. The wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were written the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The angel who talked to me held in his hand a gold measuring stick to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. When he measured it, he found it was square as wide. It was a square, as wide as it was long. In fact, its length and width and height were each 1,400 miles. Then he measured the walls and found them to be 216 feet thick, according to the human standard used by the angel. The wall was made of jasper, and the city was pure gold. As clear as glass, the wall of the city was built on foundation stones inlaid with 12 precious stones. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The twelve gates were made of pearls, each gate from a single pearl, and the main street was pure gold as clear as glass. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple, and the city has no need of sun or moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day, because there is no night there, and all the nations will bring their glory and honor into the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me a river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. And there will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires his prophets has sent his angel to tell his servants what will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon. 
Blessed are those who obey the words of the prophecy written in this book. Look, I am coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. What do you live towards? Where is your treasure? I was reading through this passage with a, uh, with a friend of mine. We were doing a Bible study together. And perhaps him, perhaps with you like with him, he struggled with why we would even want to go to heaven. Now I realize for some of you that seems like a foreign concept because you have grown up to understand the beauty and the awesomeness of heaven and so you anticipate it with joy. But for this individual, he couldn't get his head around why is heaven such an awesome place? I mean, what is so great about sitting on a cloud with a harp? What is so great about never-ending church services for all of eternity? And I've got to tell you, I'm, I'm on the same page as him. Because if that's what heaven is... Why do we strive so hard to reach heaven? If heaven is just a way to live for longer, why do we strive to go to heaven? There must be more to it than that. Last time I was with you, I spoke on the subject of hope. And I said to you that hope is what gets us out of bed in the morning. Hope is why we keep going when life falls apart. Hope is that thing that makes it all worthwhile, that says no matter how bad it gets, it's, there's still a good reason to keep on going. And when there is no hope, we give up. I didn't have time that day to unpack with you what heaven is. And I'm hoping that as you have read some things here, we'll pick up on just a few things that we've read. I read the whole thing because I wanted you to read the whole thing. I want you to see that there's more in Scripture than just the few high points that I might pick out for a sermon. Read Scripture. See the picture for yourself. Let your mind grasp the images. Let it become part of your imagination. And let, it, let, it, let it sink deep into your heart because where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The old heaven... The old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. No more division, no more separation, no more continents separated by hundreds and thousands of miles with families stretched across, across gulfs that we cannot, that we cannot easily uh, uh, transcend. A, a, a habitation, a home for human beings, a place where we are together, the new heavens and the new earth. The holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. You see, this, this chapter, this picture of heaven isn't just about a place where we get to pet lions and slide down giraffes' necks. You know, we, we, we have this picture, this imagery of, as children of what heaven will be like. And I'm not trying to take that away either. I think that's going to be awesome. I do want to swim with dolphins. And, and I don't want to have to be afraid of great white sharks. And, and I would like a little lion cub as, as, as a kitten and as a pet. Because if you've ever seen them on TV, you know they're awfully cute. But in this world, they grow up to be dangerous and ferocious because of the effects of sin. Not a part of the Creator's original intent for life on earth. But I want you to know that, that, that the, way, the way Revelation begins to explain heaven is as a completion to the angel's message to Mary. The angel comes to Mary and says, You shall call his name Jesus, which means salvation is of Jehovah, or Jehovah saves. Because that's what Jesus is. Jesus is the solution. He is the heavenly ambassador. He is the, he is the heavenly sacrifice, the great high priest, the all-in-one. He, he is the source of a new covenant. He is the one who redeems and saves. But then it goes on to say, and you shall call him, what? God with us. That, by the way, Emmanuel is the name. That, by the way, is one of the, most, uh, one of the simplest yet most profound arguments for the divinity of Christ. <laughs> Have you thought about it? One text. How do you know Jesus is God? Because the angel that announced his birth said, God 
with us. And here in Revelation, you have a picture of all the fullness of God's intent of God with us coming to be in the final act of bringing sin to an end. You see, the plan of salvation doesn't end at the cross. The plan of salvation doesn't end with the priestly ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary. The plan of salvation doesn't end at the end of this thing we call the investigative judgment, the high priestly ministry of Jesus Christ. The plan of salvation doesn't even end when Jesus returns to to take his faithful to be with him for the thousand years in heaven. No, the plan doesn't even end there. The plan culminates in Emmanuel, God with us to the fullest extent. It is why heaven is moved. It is why the new Jerusalem descends. It is why we don't just go there, but why he recreates the heavens and the earth. A new planet for us, burned clean, restored, the home of humanity. Humanity which Christ himself shares for all of eternity. Humanity which he didn't just temporarily adopt to solve a problem. Humanity, the creation brought into the very being of the uncreated, the eternal, the immortal. The creator himself. Adopted not for a season, not for a time period, not for a mission, not for a a mere purpose, but for fellowship, for intimacy. You see, salvation happened in the person of Jesus. Salvation isn't just what happens to you and me when we accept Jesus. Salvation happened in the person of Jesus. Sin brought separation between God and human beings. It it ripped us apart from the creator. It, It drove an eternal wedge between us. And even before he dies on the cross, salvation is effected for humanity in the birth of Jesus where humanity is born into the divine being. The two are merged into one. We were reconciled in Christ, not just by the cross, but by the very incarnation, by the very, by the very act of God seeking us out. And it's not complete until the home of divinity is blended with the home of humanity. And that's how Revelation begins by picturing what heaven is. Heaven isn't just a place far away. Heaven is reconciliation with God. And you might say that, therefore, heaven begins now. And that would, be, that would probably be, in a spiritual sense, quite right. It is the kingdom of God brought into human time when Jesus was born. It is the kingdom of God in us when we receive Christ into us, when we receive the Holy Spirit, where we become partakers of the divine nature. But heaven is not yet here until the very location of heaven and the very location of human homes is bound together in a way that can never be separated. That's what heaven is. That's what the coming of Jesus is. It's finishing the plan of salvation. It is God making his home with us. It is Emmanuel. It is God with us. There is still so much more to experience and know and see firsthand in this plan of salvation. Don't miss it. Don't miss out for some cheap artificial copy down here on earth. Don't don't miss out for some earthly kingdom or some attempt to build your own empire. And forsake being a part of the empire of God. He carries on. He carries on. He says he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. We love that verse. We love that verse at funerals. We love that verse in our heartache and in our brokenness and in our disappointed dreams. We love that verse. We cling to it because it is hope. It is hope expressed in the book of Revelation. It is that he will wipe away every tear. I want you to know. I want you to know something. And this this may sound a little bit bizarre. But there's some of us who think, how can I enjoy heaven if a loved one of mine isn't there? What if I get there and my husband isn't there? My wife isn't there? What if I get there and my children are not there? What if I get there and someone who's dear and precious to me, I cannot imagine life down here without them. What happens if they are not there? I want you to know this hope. I want you to, I want you to keep your eyes on the heavenly kingdom. And I want you to trust, I want you to trust what God promises, that he will wipe away every tear, that heaven will still be worthwhile even if someone that you love dearly, that you cannot imagine life without down here, doesn't make it through their own choice, through their own willfulness, through their intent to build their own kingdom instead of being a part of the kingdom of God. Whatever their choice, 
Believe me, Scripture is saying it is worth being there because he will wipe away every tear. You will not grieve for all eternity. You will not miss them for all of eternity. There is healing. There is restoration in ways I can't explain. I don't know how he's going to do it, but the promise is that he will. Heaven is not forever marred by the sadness of the lost. Because that wouldn't be heaven. That would be perpetuating the brokenness of this planet. Every tear, every ounce of pain, all the sadness, the sorrow, the only time you will ever see water dripping out of somebody's eyes in heaven will be when they worship in joy before the throne. Never again because of this. You know, the thing about heaven is it's not more of the same of this. It's different. Altogether different. The one sitting on the throne said, look, I'm making everything new. Write this down. What I tell you is trustworthy and true. It is finished. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely of the springs of the water of life. To all who are victorious, they will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. You see, it's not just a cloud. It's not just the assignment of a harp. It's not just that you join a heavenly choir. It's not just this picture of worship for all eternity. It is relational connectedness. It is the very highest form of what you and I were created for. To be eternally connected, not only with God, but with one another. For all of eternity. Now, I mean, get your head around this. Eternity is is an immense measure of time. It's a measure of time for which there is no end. There is no no end point to that measuring line. It just goes on and 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 on infinitely. We struggle with that because we're so finite. There must be a beginning and there must be an end. That's life as we know it on earth. You are born, you live, you die. Creation, it came into being. We know that it comes to an end or it is reborn through what we're describing here. There is beginnings and there is ends to everything that we do in this world. It's, I'm convinced that it is impossible for us to actually get our heads around eternity. But I still want you to try. I still want you to try because I want you to understand. I'm going to try and describe it in a way to you that might make sense. Because when we just talk about numbers, when I say to you, you know, it's six trillion, 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 trillion. There's so many zeros at the end of that. I, I don't even know how many zeros there are. I don't even know. I don't even have the vocabulary to articulate numbers that are seven trillion, 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 trillion. I'm not even sure human beings have invented that kind of vocabulary. So it's hard, it's hard for us to comprehend eternity in terms of numbers, the scope of time. But what if we follow Revelation's idea here and we, and we picture eternity in terms of relationship? Think about this. How many people will be saved for eternity? Well, we don't know. We don't know. But we know that there'll be millions and millions I mean, there's 7 billion on planet Earth now. Does that make sense? How many have lived that are now dead before that? We don't know. But there's 7 billion now. Does that make sense? I mean, so, so let's, just, let's just pick a number. Let's say, let's say 6 billion people are saved from all of history. And I think that's probably too few. But, but let's, just, let's just work with that number, right? 6 billion people from planet Earth are saved. How many people do you know right now? 50? 100? How many acquaintances do you have right now? 200? 400? How many people in your Facebook account? Some of us, 50. Others of us, 2,500. Now think about this. That is a very small circle of friends in the scope of those who will hypothetically be saved, right? We just picked a number, 6 billion. Think of eternity this way. Eternity is so long. Eternity is so long that you can meet, introduce yourself, 
have relationship with, have personal stories and history with all six billion of those people. Because it's taken you 50, 60, 70, some of you 80 or 90 years to know what? 400 people? Some of whom you cannot remember the names of. You're vague on the faces. You can't remember your history or story with them. Many of them you have no history or story. You've just met them and shook their hands. Some of them you've only seen from a distance. Eternity is so long that you can have dinner with all six billion of those people over time. That you can meet those people and know them and go places with them and have stories to tell with all six billion of them and the brain to remember it. How does that frame eternity? Not just as time without end, but as connectedness, as relationship, as knowing and being known for all of eternity. No time pressures, no full stops, no ending points. All of the redeemed, all of the saved. We haven't even mentioned the untold billions of angels. We haven't even mentioned the untold billions of unfallen worlds out there. Eternity, time without end, is so long that you can know all of them by name, have encounters with every single one of them, have experiences and history and story, and sit around the campfire with another group of planets and say, and there was this time I met this guy. His name was James. Did we have a good time? We found this awesome waterfall together. That's what we did. And then we found ourselves standing before the throne of God. Him and me, it was this day. And the Lord was right there in front of us as we sang the praises, as we knelt before Him, as we... James was right there by my side. You see, that's what eternity is going to be like. Experiences with people, without end, without limit. I can't picture eternity in terms of time and numbers but I can begin to grasp eternity in terms of knowing people, experiencing people, personal friendships, not just acquaintances, given enough time, personal friendships with all of the redeemed. And then in the midst of all this positiveness, there's verse 8. I typically skip that when I'm just talking about heaven because it just seems so... Well, negative. I mean, listen to this. You've, you've just gone, it's just this amazing picture of heaven, and then there's this, but cowards, unbelievers, the corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers, and liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second. Just take verse 8 out there, man. You've got all this good, po positive picture stuff going on about heaven, and then you throw this, 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 this verse 8 in. And it dawned on me one day as I was reading this. This, maybe it is written as a warning to those who are cowards, liars, or corrupt, and all of that. I mean, I'm sure it serves that purpose, but, but maybe it's not written for them. Maybe it's written for the redeemed. Maybe what it's saying is profoundly positive. Maybe what it's saying is that heaven will be free of everything that brings suffering and pain and injustice down here. All those who align themselves with these principles unrepentantly, who will not turn from these principles, they will not sneak in. They will not bribe their way in. They will not make it into that place. It's a profoundly positive verse. It is assurance for those of us who have experienced the brokenness of this world at the hands of other sinners. Of course, it's a warning if you're one of them. But the way I make sense of that verse is it's a profound statement. That heaven is going to be run on different principles, a different government, with an eye who sees all things and with a, with a heart, by a heart, who knows all people, who will make no mistakes in the final judgment, and who guarantees the promise that there is something better than this world. So if you are suffering at the hands of the cowards and the unbelievers, the corrupt, the murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshippers and liars, if you are suffering at the hands of those people, some of those people, all of those people, in your daily walk now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to wake up tomorrow morning and say, there is something that's still worth living for. 
It's on the horizon. I can see it. Its kingdom has already come into this world. Emmanuel has already been born and Emmanuel will still finish the work. I can see the kingdom on the horizon. He took me in the spirit to a great and high mountain. He showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. And now we move into a portion here which is describing the physical heaven. We've spoken about the relational connectedness. We've spoken about how we can make sense of the, of the time that is given through heaven eternity. We've spoken about, we've spoken about the, the end of suffering and pain and all things normal on this earth. We've spoken about all of that. And now it describes the beauty of heaven. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that except to say that everything we base our world on, everything that is of value to us down here, everything our economies are built on, the bedrock of gold... The trade of diamonds and precious stones, which have brought such conflict to our world as people have prioritized those things over relationships and over people. Those things are pictured in heaven as common and ordinary building blocks. You make walls out of them. You pave streets with them. You dig foundations with them. It tells me two things. Our sense of value in this world is all upside down. <laughs> because the things that we value, the things people lay their lives down for, the, people, the, the things that people sacrifice their families to get more of, long hours at work, away from family, disconnected from the people who love them and who need them, the stuff we sacrifice our lives for, God says, is in such abundance that I'll build my city out of it. That's the first thing it says to me. It speaks to our values and it challenges us. The very construction of the city of God, the very, the very building blocks of heaven challenge our value system. When you look at the city of God through Scripture, it should challenge what you live for now. The second thing it says to me is that God is an artist. That God is an artist. He has built the place, not merely to be functional. He has built the place to blow your mind. He has built the place with incredible physical beauty. And no, it's not the highest priority of heaven. And it's no, no, it's not the central theme of heaven. But he is a God of beauty in every way. He's a God of beauty in character. He's a God of beauty relationally. He's a God of beauty in the plan of salvation. He's a God of beauty as an architect, as a builder of the heavenly world. He has built a place that will blow your mind. And we spend our lives living as slaves to get that which is abundant in heaven. And then he talks in chapter 22 about a water of life, a river that flows from the very throne room of God. Don't you want to drink that water? I, want, I wonder what it tastes like. One thing I know is it hasn't been chlorinated. One thing I know is that no one's added that stuff to make your teeth stronger. What's it called? Fluoride. Fluoride. Pure and clear. The water of life flowing from the throne of life, seated upon which is the God of life, gives birth to the tree of life, whose leaves in a vegetarian kingdom are for the healing of the nation. That's right, because nothing dies there. Nothing dies there. Fruit every month. Not the cheap stuff you buy and pack and save. Not the stuff that you buy green and has no flavor and then goes rotten before it gets ripe. Fruit that gives life. Leaves that heal. That perpetuate life by the gift of God. A place where we gather together. A, a, a central point that despite all the traveling that may happen in all the worlds you visit and, and, and the country home you may own and build outside the city of God, you come to this one place. Everyone comes there 
The implication is at least monthly. That we may eat together. That we may connect. That we may be healed. And no longer will there be a curse upon anything. I want you to know that when you travel New Zealand, one of the most beautiful places on earth, right? Seriously, not just because we live here and because we're seriously biased. It is one of the most beautiful places on earth. There are some places you can go that, that, that truly make you feel small in the presence of the Creator. There are places you can go where you can still see the master stroke of genius, the artistic beauty, the wisdom of God. But I want you to know that the most pristine places of pure as New Zealand, right, are still marred by a curse. No longer will there be a curse upon anything. For the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there and His servants will worship Him. They will see, listen to this, they will see His face. I want you to know this. One of the things I'm really looking forward to about heaven no more prayer. Does that sound very unspiritual? No more prayer. You know why? Because you talk to him. He's there. You go up to him face to face. No more worshiping a God in spirit whom we do not see in the presence of God directly when it comes to worship. Can we even comprehend what that would be like? Is it even possible for us to get this picture? I don't know that it is, but, but that's what it says. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face. His name will be written on their foreheads. No more struggle with sin. No more of this dual nature stuff within us. No more of sin trying to raise its head while we're, while we're striving by the grace of God to overcome in the name of Jesus Christ. No more of that. His name, sole ownership on our foreheads. Every thought brought into captivity to Him. Every affection of the heart. All of what is pure and holy. Part of creation, not fall. Restored in heaven forever growing to be more and more like Him. No night, no disappearing of, this, uh, of the light, for the Lord God will shine on them and they will reign forever and ever. Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. The Lord God who inspires His prophets has sent His angel to tell His servants what will happen soon. Look, I am coming soon, says Jesus. Blessed are those who obey the words of prophecy written in this book. What's my goal this morning? It's very simple. I want you to see something better. I want you to see something more beautiful. I want you to see something more clear. I want you who are forgetful to remember that what we have read this morning is just the tip of the iceberg. What we've described this morning is just the beginning of something far greater and bigger that God has in store. I want you to comprehend that whatever the voices are that are vying for your allegiance, whatever the temptations are that are drawing you towards them, nothing you can gain in this world even comes close to justifying losing the world to come. Nothing comes close. Because I want you to know that every temptation, that's the lie it tells you. Every temptation wants you to forget what we have looked at this morning. Every temptation wants you to think only of today, only of tomorrow's pleasure. Every temptation is designed to make you short-sighted. It's designed to allure you by the promise of reward now while you forget what you are losing and forsaking in the world to come. We are forgetful. And we must remember. We must remember. Bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, forgive us for being forgetful. And just put my name at the top of that list. Forgive us, Lord, for, for believing the lies that temptation brings. Forgive us for seeing this world more clearly than the world to come. 
Forgive us, Lord, where we give our allegiance to something else, someone else, anything else, before we give to you. Remind us, Jesus. May we see with the eyes of prophetic understanding. May we see with the eyes of the Spirit. May our lives down here be shaped, guided, transformed by what you have promised for the future. Thank you, Jesus, for coming into this world, Emmanuel. Thank you for dwelling with us now, Emmanuel. And thank you, Jesus, for coming again, for bringing your home to be reconciled with our home, Emmanuel. Amen. Instead of a song to close us off this morning, we're going to play out with a little video that I trust will speak to you.